Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to another episode on the SITREP Podcast. I am your host, Ariskany Jim, and apologies for all the running around today, guys. We had some pretty... It's been an epic day. Let's just put it that way. As far as technical issues go, sound issues, connectivity issues, internet issues, never mind about all that. Here on the SITREP Podcast, our problems do not become your problems, no matter what uh, issues we run across, we will deliver our content to you on time and on target, or at least on the same day. We might be a few hours late, but we'll get it out to you no matter what. We'll figure out a way to get it to you. Even if it's by smoke signal, carrier pigeon, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to uh, to deliver our schedule you know, to our community. We definitely appreciate you guys supporting us, and uh, we make sure that uh, that, re- that uh, appreciation is reciprocated in you know form of just more content. So this was the, what was supposed to be a live game here on the SITREP podcast. The stream was supposed to go out at about 2 p.m. this afternoon. Um, yeah, it <laughs> didn't really work. However, I figured out a way to stream just on YouTube. So we're going to stream this now on YouTube, and then we're going to come back and post the replay link on Facebook, on Discord, and our other platforms. So no matter what, you're going to get your content. So again, apologies for the delay, but here we are. What was supposed to be the topic for today's game was Soviets versus Mujahideen in Afghanistan 1983, or four or five, the mid-80s. I kind of picked 1983 at random. It doesn't really matter. Um, I do specify, however, mid-80s because there are certain technological changes that take place during the Soviet-Afghan war, which we'll get into when we get to it. But this is not the initial invasion, and this is not the earlier phases of the insurgency, 1980, 81, 82. Uh, This is a little bit later when the Americans and the CIA get involved, and yeah, we'll get into that when we get into that. So, the game was played. We were recording small bits, bits of it. We were supposed to stream it live. That didn't happen. We said, okay, fallback position. We're gonna record small segments of it and try to put those out during the week ahead. Okay, that's a couple problems with that. Number one, it takes like forever to edit this stuff. I still have other stuff in my editing pipeline. And number two, you guys don't get content until like Wednesday at the earliest. What the hell with that? So we're gonna put something out now today. And again, I figured out a way to stream on YouTube only. Um, Something wrong with our other multi-streaming platform. We'll figure that part out of it later, but no worries. So, um, this was our topic for today. Me and Damon did play this game, and rather than you know try to cobble together some some recorded bits later, we're just going to go ahead and walk through uh, what happened today. It is coming up on midnight in the UK, so Damon is not with us unfortunately. But uh, hopefully, I will. Uh, if I make any mistakes in the gameplay, please, Damon, correct me in the comments. So the system we were using is Valor and Victory. Valorant of Victory was originally developed by Barry Doyle for World War II Infantry Combat, one of the best games to come out in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I say that with every awareness. And what makes it really great is the original physical pen and paper, print and play, whatever you want to call it, the original board game version of it uh, is free. It, it was you know, offered to the community. So if there's a sainthood for war games, if there's a heaven for war games, if there's a Mount Rushmore of war games, chisel that man's face up there because, I mean, he's really created one of the better games, literally one of the better games out there. And uh, he literally gave it to the community as a gift. So as many of you may know, uh, I was able to reach out to Barry on Board Game Geek, get his blessing to create a modern expansion of this to take his great system and sort of expand it into post-1945 decades. And of course, you guys have probably seen us on our channel before. We've done Lebanon in 82, the Falklands in 82, Mogadishu in 93, um, Afghanistan in 2006. We've done all kinds of stuff using Valor and Victory moving forward into the uh, 80s, 90s, and, you know, the current century. What we're looking at here today is again, Afghanistan 1983. So this is our first time with these new units and these new orders of battle. We went ahead and gave it a test. So here is our background. Um, everyone knows where Afghanistan is. Uh, you know, literally almost everybody in the world has tried to invade this country at least once. It never seems to work out. 
Alexander the Great uh, started off there. He's the first guy that I even know about. Um, Genghis Khan, various Persian satraps, the British twice, the Soviets, then uh, the United States and some allies. It, it's never worked out for anybody. I don't know why anyone invades Afghanistan. There's nothing there, really, and you always, you know, crawl out of there with your ass in a sling, you know, 20 years later. Um, of course, the United States is no exception anymore, uh, as we saw in 2021. We can take cold comfort in the fact that we have some pretty good company. So, yeah. Um, nothing more really to say about that. Anyway, this is the situation in the 1980s from the Soviet perspective. Um, I realize this map might be a little opaque if you don't read Russian. Um, I don't really speak or read Russian, but after you know spending about 36% of my life pouring over Soviet military maps from World War II and the Cold War, I've learned to read a little military Russian, if that's like a sub-language. So I'm, I'm able to, to kind of figure out what some of this stuff is. And uh, I've translated a little... Oh, my Lord translated a little bit of it here so the unit that we're looking at specifically now that everything's moving is in the wrong place is this unit right here third battalion of the 177th motor rifle regiment so mcn is motor rifle regiment um i don't ask me to pronounce that but i i know yeah motor rifle regiment so as you can see there's a lot of motor rifle regiments around there Third Battalion, 177th, that is part of the 108th Motor Rifle Division. These are, you see their main divisional flag there. This is one of the three or four main divisions that's sort of made up with the Soviets called the 40th Combined Arms Army. That was the main umbrella organization responsible for the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, 1979 to 1989. The lead motor rifle regiment of the 108th is the 177th, and again, we're playing a small unit of the 3rd Battalion uh, thereof. Here is the general situation in Afghanistan from the other perspective, and this actually tries to map out the primary areas of influence of all the different factions, and splinter groups, and Islamic Revolutionary Councils, and there, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I went through this last night, pretty much all night, trying to figure this mess out to give some sort of legitimacy to our Mujahideen units. Uh, it's up to you how successful I was. Nevertheless, we did sort of, you know, come up with some pretty solid estimates as far as where certain militias and factions had more control and where they, uh, where they fought the Soviets in the 1980s. But if the CIA can't figure this out in 20 years, you can't expect me to figure it out overnight. I can't even figure out how to do multi-streaming, so <laughs> there, that's that. Here was our map for today's game, uh, along with Damon's setup. Damon was playing the Mujahideen Rebels. I was going to play the Soviets. So the Mujahideen is, you know, the usual. Uh, as we've seen in previous Valor and Victory Modern Expansion games, there are leaders. Some of the leaders are negative zero. That might look weird to Valor, veteran Valor and Victory players, but it's basically a commander that allows, or leader I should say, that unlocks all of the leadership ability rules in Valor and Victory. Uh, accelerated movement, calling in artillery, calling in off-board assets, stuff like that. Um, at the same time, however, doesn't give an actual firepower bonus or a morale bonus. So they're a leader, technically, they're just not very good. Um, then there are some negative ones, and of course we have one badass, negative two, he's the head honcho. He pretty much runs the show for the Mujahideen here in the uh, in this particular area. We've got a Dushka here. I mean, you guys have seen this in other Valorant Victory games. It's a bunch of stolen and captured Soviet stuff that the Mujahideen have picked up over the previous years. Again, we're like halfway through the war, 1983, 4, 5, somewhere in there. Um, so there's plenty of Soviet uh, gear around. Some new that you haven't seen before. Support weapons are under-barrel grenade launchers. So in 1993 and forward, games, actually 1990 and forward, most factions have under-barrel grenade launchers already worked into their base anti-personnel firepower. 
Um, I won't get into how that works now because it's not in this game. This is previous to that. This is the 1980s when M203s, GP25s, and other similar underbarrel grenade launchers were not in every single fire team in most organized armies and even uh, you know better equipped militias. So here they're still special enough to actually necessitate a under a, a, a support unit counter, support weapon counter, I should say. There are civilians on the table. They will not be played as usual because the insurgents never care about civilians in Valor and Victory Modern Expansion. And usually the government force has to watch out for civilians, but we're playing 1984 Soviets, pre-Gorbachev Soviets. No shit's given when it comes to civilians. Um, they're still on the table because they can still absorb casualty points. You can still, I know this sounds horrible, but this is Afghanistan in the 1980s. You can still use them as human shields, uh, and they are still uh, can screw up your stacking points. They are worth um, one squad's worth of stacking points. So, yeah, they're still tactically on the table. They just won't have the full rules of engagement effect on the Soviet player that the government army normally has to deal with when you are... Um, that the government player normally has to, uh, you know, deal with when playing Valor and Victory Bottom Expansion. So, yeah. Now, here's that road I was talking about before. You know, let's get into the orders first. So here were the orders. The Soviet player. Um, I won't read all this because nothing's more annoying than having someone read a PowerPoint slide to you while they're asking you to watch the PowerPoint slides, so I'm not going to get into it. But basically, you guys can see what the orders are here. The basic idea is there is this main highway leads from Termez in what is today Uzbekistan. Before it was the Uzbekaya CCP. Now it's Uzbekistan. They're heading here out of the town of Termez. That's 108th Motor Rifle Division's actual main garrison base. They were uh, they're in charge of keeping hold of this northern road that leads down toward Kabul. That's obviously Kabul in Russian. And this is their main, one of their main military arteries leading from their actual invasion points to the capital of the country. So, fine. Problem is, the people in these two, or I should say the Mujahideen, in these two provinces have been squeezing this road with mines, artillery, not artillery, artillery, but mines, mortars, and rocket strikes. And so the Soviets have started to, number one, these motor rifle regiments that you see here along the road, they're trying to clean that out. There's even a tank uh, battalion in there. You see TB-122 MC, so that's an actual tank battalion of the 122nd Motor Rifle Regiment. So there's even some, you know, probably T-64s, T-7, now T-64s, T-55s, you know, running up and down that highway. So that's all, you know, going on. While that's going on, the Soviets have been expanding into other routes because having your entire army rely on one military route is for logistics, supply, support, reinforcement, spare parts, POL. That's that's not a good idea. So they've been sort of expanding outwards. That's why your little reticule here, if I can actually get it to move, here we go, is slightly offset. So there's these main roads, then there's side roads, which this map might not show. But you know what? this map does. So we see the main road leading here north out of Kabul, past Bagram Air Base. Uh, I know a lot of people in our community know where that is. And up here past uh, Daoshi and then further up through uh, Balkh and Samangan. Those are the other two uh, provinces I was talking about. And where you're actually going to be fighting now here, or where our game was today here, was slightly off to the side on one of these side roads. So the Soviets in our scenario are trying to develop these side roads in order to you know, uh, open up options as far as military transport. That was basically to turn to keep the game from turning into a gigantic, you know, set piece battle, which we didn't want. Valor and Victory is a, a low level infantry game, and it's more realistic if it's like a little sideshow battle uh, on a smaller road. So, like I was saying before, this is that main this is that main road, or I should say the side road, and then there's even like uh, I guess tertiary roads side roads to the side roads, heading north into this high ground that the Mujahideen player is currently dominating. Notice he owns all the high ground, which is what he's been using to drop all kinds of artillery, mortars, again, snipers, trying to close down that road. So the Soviet job is to, okay, we do have sappers of the 45th, of the 45th 
separate engineer and separate regiment. They're based out of Charakar, and oh yeah, they are there, by the way. I didn't make that up. Uh, 45th. Uh, 45th looks like a O backwards N. CP. Yeah, that is separate engineer, sapper regiment. O is separate. Looks like a backward N. That's actually like, an, like a Y sound or an I, a long I. Um, separate engineer and sapper regiment. They are going up and down these roads. They are clearing out the mines. However, they're getting sniped in the daytime. They're getting mortars dropped on them in the daytime, and they're getting raided at night. Their convoys are in a mess. They're requesting immediate motor rifle support to basically provide them some perimeter security and, uh, you know, allow them to do their job. So that's where uh, that's where we come in as the uh, Soviet player. The Mujahideen, meanwhile, conversely, yeah, the invaders are strengthening their hold along the highways leading from Uzbekistan to the traitorous ARADRA allies. That's Army of Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. That's the communist puppet government that the Soviets tried to set up in Kabul or Kabul. Um, so again, these are these other two provinces I was talking about. They have stepped up their jihad against these highways. Now the invader is branching out his transport to support other routes. So basically, this is your hometown. This is your boss. This is the highest level of, again, I stress the word. When I say command, I mean, like, in air quotes. To say that the Mujahideen in the 1980s were organized as a, you know, formal military force is absurd. But there was a general structure of, you know, national level committees, councils, whatever you want to call it, and then, you know, uh, provincial sort of uh, bosses, and then, you know, head honchos down in small towns and villages and valleys, and these were like the local uh, militia commanders. So basically, yeah, your orders as the uh, Mujahideen commander is to establish overwatch positions over the Soviet road, make sure they don't, you know, clear out the mines, make sure that their engineers don't have free reign over this highway. And if the Russians come down the highway to, you know, take your road and push you off this high ground, hold out as long as possible. So that's pretty much where we are. So again, I was playing the Soviets. My friend Damon was playing the, uh, the Mujahideen. I moved first. I was required to come in on these two hexes here, these two road entry hexes here. He was required to set up within 12 hexes of hex A1, so he couldn't just literally festoon the entry hexes and just, you know, spawn camp them with RPGs. Turns out he didn't have to. We'll get to that in just a second. But, so he did his setup, then I came on, and uh, things went off the rails immediately. Things got absolutely crazy right off the bat because, again, today was an absolute epic day as far as technical problems, screw-ups, internet problems. Uh, I was at my wit's end by the time we even tried to start this game. My head was in 10 different directions, and it totally showed in my gameplay. I totally screwed the pooch on this one, guys, um, to the point where I literally apologized to Damon at the end of the game. I was like, I'm sorry I played so poorly. Like, I was, I was almost insulting to the opponent. You know, like, really, dude? You're, you're just going to do that? You're not even going to make me have, like, a fun, challenging game? You're just going to set yourself up for slaughter? But what can I say, guys? It's been a rough day all around. So, long story short, take your first shot. Here comes my first BTR. Let me go ahead and zoom in so we can see what's going on here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and roll right past these civilians. I'm not worried about civilians. And I get up into this hex... And I'm like, okay, I'm going to unload my infantry. Infantry have to load off, uh, offload in the same hex as your original uh, unit. I thought I was cute. I was cute at first. My entry hexes were screened from this Dushka, which it's a long shot, but that Dushka is on high ground and with an armor, uh, I'm sorry, with an anti-tank firepower rating of A, there on the corner, he can possibly put a hole in a BTR, especially at this range. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's 16, that's 160 meters away. Um, which is kind of a chip shot for a 50 cal, but still. Uh, it doesn't matter because I had cover from this building hex. No worries there. And I, I was thinking, okay, I don't want to move into this hex. 
into the hex with a big ball of flame in it. I don't want to move into that hex because he's got an RPG here. The range of the RPG is six. So he starts off on this hex. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do not move into this hex, Korvachenko. It is death. Do not go into that hex. So I'm like, okay, I'll stop here. And then I started looking at, uh, okay, am I in range of this thing? Yes. Does he have line of sight on me? Technically, yes, because of the way um, it, uh, whatchamacallit works, the way line of sight works over elevation. He has to scrape past H9. Those trees don't affect him because he's on higher elevation. This building, he's just barely missed. I got into all these tiny little details about how whether or not this guy, this BTR, is vulnerable to this Dushka here. I kind of realized I was already a possibility of getting, I already had the possibility of being hit where I was already. So I said, oh, well, since I'm already under threat, let me go ahead and move one more hex. Like a moron. Because in the middle of that whole paragraph of nonsense and rules considerations and tiny technicalities, I completely forgot about this RPG up here. My friend Damon, not so much, did not forget about the, uh, the RPG. RPG hisses down here. He needs, uh, it's technically an anti-tank weapon, so he needs an, uh, uh, an 8 to hit. He does have a negative 1 commander, so now he basically needs a 9 to hit. I think he rolled a 6. Ping! Now it's a C-class anti-tank firepower number versus my B frontal and rear armor. It's kind of the same. Uh, or frontal and flank armor. So heading over here to the anti-tank table. What do we see? To my sorrow and uh, heartbreak. Yeah, C versus a B. So you take the attacker's anti-tank or armor-piercing value, whatever you want to call it. It's pretty good. C is you know better than B, which is better than A. So you take a C, you cross-reference it versus my relatively poor armor. It's only a BTR-60, guys. Yeah, I wind up with a 9. So that's a 9 or less. He has to roll on 2d6. That's a pretty easy roll. Sure enough, he makes it. And that is toast. Uh, I wasn't sure about the bailout rules for units that were in there. We do have bailout rules for helicopters in Valorant Victory Modern Expansion. That's assuming that the helicopter has been hit and there's some sort of controlled crash, like Black Hawk Down. Some guys may survive the helicopter crash. So there's rules for that. It's basically odds, evens, three up, four up, something like that. Um, However, one of the, uh, the concepts, one of the core pillars of Valorant Victory Modern Expansion is this game is written to stack on top of D plus one standard edition Valorant Victory rules. If it doesn't address it specifically in Valorant Victory Modern Expansion, go with the original Barry's original rules in Valorant Victory D plus one standard. Valorant Victory D plus one standard says that the unit... Any passengers in a transport unit shares the fate of the transport unit. The uh, transport unit goes up like a Roman candle. There goes three uh, three uh, cas casualties in there. So that was fun. Korvachenko wasn't in that hex, by the way, thankfully. And sure enough, um, I think I had... Oh, I don't have it here. I had these guys in that hex. So, Jen, I know you're going to get a kick out of this. Literally the first guy killed... The medic, right off the bat, a full squad of motor rifle infantry and my new junior sergeant, um, Shakovsky, all three blown up. I lost a PKM medium machine gun and a, a grenade launcher in there. That whole force blown off the map on the very first die roll of the game because a risk any equals um, a very, very special individual, <laughs> at least today. So I wound up with three casualty points in there. I moved up my other BTRs, unloaded them, used the advance and assault phase to get in that hex, and then I managed to evacuate one casualty point using the Valorant Victory Modern Expansion. Casualty evacuation rules that mitigates the victory point damage done to your force by casualty counters. Basically, when you're playing the regular war forces, basically the government or the formal military, the regular army, when a unit gets killed, you don't just remove it from the table you know, Flames of War style or 40k style. There's now a casualty in that hex that has to be dealt with. You have to evacuate them as soon as possible. You've already lost too many victory points because of the casualty. If you leave him out there to die, or if even worse, he gets captured by the Mujahideen, yeah, that's not so good. You're going to wind up with a double victory point penalty assessed against you. 
So there's a game-related reason why you got to take care of your men. Even the Soviets in the 1980s. I know everyone thinks they're the bad guys, and they yeah, they kind of were the bad guys, especially in Afghanistan. But they are still a regular force. They have medics. Their troops are trained. When a guy goes down, you've got to get him out of there. Um, so, yeah, I was. that's the reason for what I did with the second BTR. Uh, pretty much parked him here. Uh, bailed out everyone, all the other troops, and then tried to lay down some covering fire from the BTR itself, while the uh, 12 men plus uh, Korvachenko uh, bailed out and got into the, uh, the casualty assessment acts. By the way, real quick, sharp-eyed viewers will see and perhaps uh, recognize, because I always have fun doing this when I create a new army in Valor and Victory. The leaders do get names. Yes, we do have a Korvachenko, we do have a Golikov, there's a Kaminsky somewhere, I may not have used in this game, there's, yeah. So if you've ever seen the uh, 1988 movie The Beast, sometimes called The Beast of War, it's a great movie about the Afghanistan war told from both the Soviet and the Mujahideen perspective, those are the Soviet characters in the, in the, in the show. So that's Stephen Baldwin right there, and this is Jason Patrick. Although, sadly, he's not a vampire, so I wasn't able to access any of his flying abilities. I could have used them, I'm not going to lie. Um, cool. So we have a bot in the chat, no worries, I'll delete that later. The Red Cross is a damn target. Yeah, it's just, it, it was either that, uh, what, what can I say? Um, I didn't even mean to do it, it just kind of worked out that way. So that was the fun fun on turn one. Then his turn came along, and he starts, you know, uh, this... Who's this guy's name again? Um, uh, Bakhtari, he's kind of the main honcho here. He can see down into this hex. He starts calling in uh, mortar support from, like, old American or captured Soviet, um, you know, mortars. It's not, it's not good, man. He starts dropping mortars on me down here. Um, guys start getting hit and pinned down. It's just a, a shit show. Um, I screwed this game up from the outset, and not just technically, like the internet connection. I mean, I also screwed up the gameplay after that. It's been a rough, rough afternoon, guys. I'm not even going to lie. But, hey, fair play to Damon. He saw his enemy make a mistake, and he took advantage of it. If you're ever going to be kind, and, oh, we'll let the enemy get away with this one. It's not when you're playing the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against the Soviets. That war was absurdly brutal by both sides. You do not want to become a prisoner in this war. Uh, you're not going to live to see the sunrise. I mean, trust me, it's it's nasty. So, yeah, it was not a time to pull punches. And to Damon's credit, he did not pull punches. He blew a third of my ta a third of my force off the table on the first roll of the dice, and I couldn't even fault him for it because it was totally my mistake. Turn two, things in some ways get even worse for me. So, Soviet support assets include two helicopter strikes. Now, these are off-board assets. They are not unlike the fighter-bomber strikes, which you may be familiar with in Valor and Victory. So, they're not actual pieces that show up on the table. We do have helicopters for that. That's usually transport birds, Blackhawks, MI-8s, stuff like that. Um actual transport helicopters that have to maneuver on the table because they are either dropping off or dusting off either infill or exfill trading actual troops and therefore subject to additional ground fire. These are MI-24 Victor Crocodiles. No, they're not called Heinz. That's the NATO name for them. They're not NATO birds. They are Soviet birds. So let's use the Soviet name for them. Although, admittedly, Crocodile, even then, is kind of a nickname. But anyway, long story, and I know that those are not, those are those look more like uh, uh, super cobras there. But it's basically a fighter-bomber strike. We do have additional rules in Valorant Victory Modern Expansion that talk about how fighter-bomber strikes have changed since the 1940s. Spoiler alert, they've gotten a lot more powerful, and they're even harder to, you know, avoid. So those rules are kind of cooked into the Valorant Victory Modern Expansion rules. I think it's 9.51 in the Valorant Victory Modern Expansion book. If you're interested, the book is available uh, as a free PDF on our Discord. But anyway, I called in my my um, my helos. 
because I gotta do something here. I got two helos. So two birds come in. Each one of them has the rocket strike, which is basically a Valor and Victory old school World War II style uh, fighter bomber strike times two. It, it, the simple way to make it more powerful, have it double. Okay. On top of that, they also get chain gun strikes. There's a 20 millimeter chain gun and also a 12.7 millimeter chain gun or really heavy machine gun on the nose of these birds. And uh, they hang around for, uh, they can also put in their strikes uh, at, at their option. So the spe it's all laid out in the special rules. This was all kind of laid out ahead of time. Um, I won't go through all the details. I won't read a PowerPoint slide to you because, again, that's annoying. But basically, these are the rules. So, yeah, I called in my, uh, my, my crocodiles. Here's the problem. The Mujahideen had some special rules, too. I told you we are going to get back to this. This is why I said it in the mid-1980s. Because the CIA and Charlie Wilson and all his friends have been cruising around Afghanistan handing out stingers for free. Talk about the FIM-92A Stinger Man Pads. Man Portable Air Defense System. Or basically, surface air missile. Single man surface air missile system. So a couple things about this unit, because you definitely won't find this in World War II Valor Victory. Um, it has a range of 20, which, okay, the, the whole board isn't 20 hexes wide, so it can basically hit anything on the table, or anything coming on the table, and of course, uh, in the case of these MI-24s. It does not have any kind of armor-piercing value. It cannot engage troops. It has no armor-piercing uh, armor or anti-personnel value. It's strictly AA. It's there to shoot down aircraft, and that's all. And I know that a Stinger is not an expendable weapon. Um, I have it marked as expendable here with this black box with a white X in it. Hear me out. It's one missile tube and one missile. I didn't want to have this thing reloading and shooting down Heinz for the rest of you know the game. Now, that actually helps both players. Number one. It helps the Russians, obviously, because it's also unrealistic that they would have that many Stinger missiles. Uh, these things were rare. They did have them in Afghanistan, especially uh, even in the early 80s. They had a lot more of them later in the 80s. But in the early 80s, they were just getting them. They're kind of rare. And if you have one, okay, you can launch the missile at it. Also, I don't know how long it takes to reload a Stinger. It's not like slapping a new magazine in an AK-74 or a new belt and a PKM. Uh, loading a stinger and rearming it and reacquiring a target and so on and so forth, that's going to be tough. And to be honest, you're never going to get a second shot with it anyway. Because the Soviets only have two airstrikes, they're going to call them both in at the same time. Why wouldn't they? So you're never going to get a second shot anyway. Making the weapon a normal support weapon, like a Dushka or a, douche, a heavy machine gun, or a PKM, or who knows what else, or an RPD, making them like any other support weapon means you kind of have to assign it to a unit. Who's carrying this thing? Now, the Soviet player, because there's no hidden information in the Valor and Victory system, now the Soviet player can sort of cheese and either... Oh, I'm going to have my helicopters move in a such, such a certain way where they never draw fire from the Stingers. Well, it's an off-board mission, so that's kind of cheesy anyway. Number one. Number two, they're just going to go straight for the, the Stingers off the bat. Well, the Soviet helicopter gunship pilots don't know where the Stinger is on the table. That would be cheesy. So that's the reason I've made it basically in rules mechanics language like a grenade. You know, whenever you need a grenade, I know it doesn't work like this in the video game system, but in the original uh, board game system, the grenades are just assets that get used uh, by units as they need them. They never get deployed on the table as such, um, and therefore they never get assigned to a specific unit. Same thing with the Stinger. You just only use it against aircraft. So where the Stinger is, it's kind of in a quantum state. It's everywhere and nowhere until it's needed, and then, boom, you open up the trunk, you see if your cat is alive or dead, per Schrodinger's equation, and then you realize if your crocodile is alive or dead. Well, spoiler alert, my crocodile is very dead. Because here are the potential results that we had written into our special rules.
for what happens when his one stinger shoots at my crocodiles before I make my attack. It's kind of a weird special rule. It's an opportunity to fire during my command phase, which within strict Valorant victory doesn't make any sense. But the whole point of having a SAM is to shoot down the enemy aircraft before he hits you, depending if you hit. So two to five, yeah, he shoots me down before he makes the attack. Or he can destroy my helicopter after the helicopter makes its gun pass. So the, the hind does its whole, you know, Rambo 3 style, you know, strafing running rockets. They blow up a whole bunch of stuff. And then it's are peeling off and heading away. Then the stinger locks on and hits him. Or the stinger can damage or panic the pilot. And he has to run away. Basically, no airstrike happens. He's defended himself from the airstrike. But no victory points are assessed for shooting down the hind. Spoiler alert, the hind is worth six victory points. It's, it's pretty important. Or, if I get really lucky, uh, 10, and he just misses. Well, he rolled a 4, because Damien's dice were on fire today. Blew the hind out of the sky. Kapow. That kind of stank. So I said, all right. I brought in my second helo strike. My second helo strike eliminated that RPG team, uh, or most of that RPG team that was in this hex. This is where he fired that RPG from that blew up my first BTR-60. I killed most of it. I fired off both my rockets. I fired off both my chain guns, with both, which both missed. But the rockets did some damage. They killed most of them. They pinned down everybody that was left. And that's when Golikov's uh, squad and a half that had been here in this little building hex jumped the wall, ran down. They did take one uh, pin down damage from this RPG squad that was here. He was the only guys that could see them during opportunity fire phase. And then once they got to L5, they hooked right and they uh, assaulted this hex. Everybody in that hex that was left alive was pinned down. So that guy, that Mujahideen rebel, that air quotes freedom fighter that roasted 13 men alive in that BTR-60. Yeah, he's now a prisoner of the Soviets. So good luck with all that. Good luck living through the night, pal. We got a nice metal chair, backup battalion, and a whole roll of duct tape. You're not going to have a very good day. Um, it did cost me a little bit, though, because I have all kinds of issues now. Some of my guys are pinned down. Uh, I now have to rally their... I'm going to take these two guys off here. I have to rally uh, troops to get them out of there. Um, other uh, units were um, dying. Other casualty points were either bleeding out. Valor and Victory Modern Expansion has a bleed out check rule. And uh, if I don't evacuate them in time, Korvachenko was pretty much, uh, uh, what's the word here? An improvised medic. He was just trying to evacuate as many guys as he could out of that little miniature holocaust here from the BTR. Uh, yeah, he got, he, I think he got two of them off. The third one didn't make it. He failed his bleed out check before I could evacuate him. So, so yeah, it's, it's been tough. It's been tough. Okay, so um, I had a lot of fire coming down at me down from this ridge. I tried to swing both BTRs around these hooch, not hooches, around these uh, these Afghan buildings. And then to shoot up here, there was a whole stack of enemy troops here in Juliet 10. But as I did that, he took opportunity fire with his Dushka, which at the time was here. He shoots down here. These woods in J10 pay him no, or don't cause him any problem because they're at lower elevation than he is. He most of the elevation steps. He shoots down off this high ground. Boom. Hitting him's easy. To hit with a, quote, anti-tank gun in this game is, or I think we call the, the douche gun anti-tank weapon because it's not a dedicated anti-tank gun. But even if it was, no big deal. We're looking at a uh, to hit number of eight. There's a negative two commander in there. Make that to hit number of ten. Hitting it's the easy part. It's a BTR-60 and it's less than 200 meters away. Pop, 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 pop. Off goes the Dushka. Good news is it's A-class 50 caliber ammunition against B-class um, like 14 millimeters of plate. So it's not too bad. A versus B. He has to roll a 5 on 2d6 to immobilize me. A 2, 3, or a 4 will actually destroy me. So again, this number is what you need to actually penetrate the armor. If you make it exactly on the number, you immobilize the vehicle. If you beat that number, again, in Valor Victory, you always want to roll low. If you get under that number, you destroy the vehicle. Of course, Damon rolls a four, and the absolute uh, 
tragic comedy that is a Ruskini's luck in <laughs> Afghanistan continues to uh, yeah just keep going. So yeah, he gets blown up. At least he had unloaded his troops already. Obviously, we talked about that last turn. So I didn't lose another whole squad and a half. A BTR has a published carrying capacity of 14 men. A squad in Valorant Victory is usually considered about eight guys. So I know it says T1 on the counter. Eh, I don't want to make it T2 because that's too much. But I just made it, consider T1 and a half. So four men and a half squad, eight men and a full squad, that's 12, plus a commander, that's 13. Now you got one point left over for extra ammo, support weapons, stuff like that. Things were going so well for Damon that he decided to say, you know what? Again, this guy used to have a lot of friends. Um, Mr. Uh, Akgar there. He says, we're hauling ass down here, down here into M11. The last BTR that I have takes point blank opportunity fire. Negative two, point blank. If there were any infantry units still in that hex, I could throw grenades in there as well. But of course there weren't. So a BTR-60 has a belt fed Basically a vehicle version of the PKM um, medium machine gun. Um, nasty little weapon. Kind of a Russian M60. Uh, or an M240. A heavy 7.62 millimeter, roughly six to 700 cyclic rate of fire, uh, belt fed general purpose machine gun. And then I think they call it a KPVT. I might have the letters slightly off. It's even bigger than a Dushka. It's a 14.5 millimeter that works out to 60 caliber heavy machine gun. I say heavy machine gun. It's practically an auto cannon. Um, yeah. And then I think I rolled snake eyes or a three or something absurd. This entire squad and a half, like 13 Mujahideen, just disappeared in a red mist. As finally, my BTR has got a little bit of payback. Um... I mean, for God's sake, man. finally. So, yeah, that pretty much wrapped up turn two. Turn three, um, I mean, I know I've lost this game by this point. Now I'm just trying to see if I can mitigate it, see if I can get some kind of redemption, get some moral victory somewhere along the line. I basically don't want to just roll over and die or call the game. I, I tell you what, I felt like just calling the game or starting over or something. Uh, but that wouldn't have been fair to Damon. I was trying to do something. Some of these uh, civilians finally started to scoot. So the way civilians work in Valorant Victory Modern Expansion, they do not uh, fall under the control of either player. Uh, they're terrified of both sides in almost every circumstance in you know, post-1945 uh, warfare. They're not usually on your side, uh, either side, to be honest. They're just trying to get the hell out of the way. So to make the game fair, because they do have a pretty significant tactical effect, especially when the government side is actually trying to play by rules of engagement, i.e. you're not allowed to shoot into a civilian hex, you're not allowed to shoot through a civilian hex, if you do have to shoot into a civilian X, and it's up to you if you want to, but good lord, to sort of penalize you for that in the game, I think they cost like quadruple victory points as a penalty. So you're just handing a huge chocolate cake with a cherry on top size platter of victory points to your opponent when you do that. But sometimes that, that civilian counter will root in an objective X, or I remember in a, in a Valorant Victory Vietnam game, that's our other big thing. This is where we've done a crap ton of Vietnam in Valorant Victory Modern Expansion. Uh, my Marines were pinned down on the base of a hill, my U.S. Marines, 1968, aftermath of the Tet Offensive. I was trying to get up a hill where the uh, NVA had a Dushka crew in a hooch, and there were civilians in the Dushka, in, in the same hex. So it was a hooch, like a squad and a half of NVA. One of them was operating a Dushka. They were absolutely murdering my guys all over these rice paddies. And uh, it was just a slaughter, man. And I couldn't shoot into the hexes. It was a good damn civilian counter in there. Finally, because again, the rules for civilian movement and how they operate is kind of randomized. Um, when they finally did move, and then they move in a random direction, two hexes. When they finally got out of there, I was like, F4 Phantom flying high. That was it, man. That, that Dushka hex was a grease spot after that. 
But until those civilians moved out of there, it, it was rough, man. And I was losing guys and half, you know, fire teams and guys were getting pinned down. And I was like, at one point, it's going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to make that decision. Do I just nuke the civilians out of there, take the eight point hit? And because, I mean, those civilians have basically inflicted, although, of course, unwittingly, at this point, eight, 10, 12 victory points worth of casualties against my guys. Sooner or later, I got to make that call. So that's the kind of decisions we try to enforce in Valorant Victory Modern Expansion. Of course, here in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen and uh, 1980s era Soviets, pre-Gorbachev Soviets, nobody cares. Um, so I was happy to see one guy, one civilian hex actually make it off the table. They move in random directions. If that random direction takes them off the table, they've, they're considered to have escaped the battle. Uh, these guys are staying put inside their building and this guy's kind of running around not knowing what's going on. So that's why you'll see civilian counters uh, move around the hex. Mr. Corporal Bite, hello, welcome to the stream. Oh my God, Corporal Bite says, if I'm going to lose anyway, I might as well gun down all the civilians, go crazy. Corporal Bite, I'm embarrassed to admit I said that uh, during the game. Again, we we were trying to stream it live. We had issues, we couldn't do it. So the game is complete and I just wanted to stream something so we had Sunday covered. Um, but yeah, halfway through the game, I was like, Damon, I'm just going to start machine gunning civilians out of frustration because I can't, <laughs> I mean, I was joking a little bit of hangman's humor there. Um, you don't get victory points for it, obviously. So there was no point. Um, I'm never going to design a game where you get rewarded for machine gunning civilians, but I was losing this game so hard that eventually I was like, oh, for God's sake. I mean, I might just do it out of frustration. Of course, happy to say I didn't. I was only kidding, but kind of, because the degree to which I lost this game. Uh, well, we'll get to the score at the end. I mean, it was it was bad. But thanks very much for um, coming out again. This was supposed to be a live game at two o'clock. We had all kinds of connection problems, so right now we're streaming only on YouTube. And once this goes up on YouTube, I'll uh, go ahead and drop the link into our other streaming platform so nobody's left out, and we'll recover the day that way. No matter what. We will always get our content to you, even if we have to use smoke signals and carrier pigeons. We'll, we'll figure out a way. Okay. So my last BTR, after absolutely obliterating that uh, Muj, that Muj squad down here, squad and a half really, um, the leader was pinned down. Uh, this little Soviet half squad carrying a what's that? That's a that's an RPK, I think. Um, Come on, select the piece, please. Really? Yeah, RPK. Uh, light machine gun. Um, he scoots forward into hex M11, assaults the pin down. Leader, again, when the leader is pinned down, there's no there's no fight back. Um, it's a free assault. You, all, If you can ever assault pin down units, do so. Um, especially when you're the Russians. And any... Mujahideen casualty points that you inflict via assault now become prisoners of war. So prisoners of war is how it is sort of the saving grace of regular armies in Valorant Victory. You're always going to have to deal with rules of engagement. You're always going to have to deal with, well, unless you're playing the Soviets in Afghanistan, but you're usually, let me rephrase that. You're usually going to be dealing with rules of engagement you're usually going to be dealing with the enemy outnumbers you, the enemies in difficult terrain, a Vietnamese jungle, Afghan mountains. You have to go up there and dig him out. He's going to get the first shot at you uh, again. Yeah, you've got the greater weapons. You've got the better soldiers. You've got ungodly off-board support options. Half the time they don't work, though. And when they don't, now you're just kind of screwed. The good news is, and how you kind of, you know, claw your way out of the hole victory point wise is by taking prisoners prisoners are worth uh double points here's the short version okay so um i want to take as many prisoners as i can so we did all that uh my btr sort of led a charge up here took this objective hex i got some uh some infantry up there that was um Korvachenko's half squad plus Korvachenko himself unfortunately um mr i keep forgetting his name here uh, Bakhtari can see him. This wall is only a hindrance. Called in a mortar strike from these godless uh, 
Mujahideen mortars up here, or mortar, this one singular mortar, um, and got another lucky roll. Damon's dice again were just absolutely on fire today. And um, yeah, blew that team out of the water. Now I've got two casualties up there and no one to evacuate them. I've already lost my medic. Regular soldiers can evacuate casualties, but you have to get a pretty good roll. Um, you have to get a pretty good roll in order to do that. So, yeah, it wasn't great. Again, I lost this game. Now I'm just trying to, you know, redeem myself a little bit. Turn four. Um, he starts pulling this Dushka off the uh, off of where it was. It was here in Golf 10. The problem is he's visible. So he realized he was about to get pasted. He starts falling back. Uh, first into F9, then into E10. Again, guys, for people who are more familiar with standard Valorant victory, Valorant Victory Modern Expansion, of course, has new units and weapons. Um, the Dushk is an absolutely enormous weapon. 106 pounds. I don't think that includes the tripod. That's just upper receiver, lower receiver, and uh, bolt carrier group. And then I think the, the, ha the tripod is another 30 or 40 pounds. So, Damon, <laughs> I was explaining to him the movement rate of a Dushka, uh, of a Dushk 50 caliber machine gun. And he was like, here's the movement rate. It's four guys swearing at each other, which is actually pretty accurate. So, Valorant Victory has two main weight classes, L for light, H for heavy. Valorant Victory Modern Expansion, again, that's my expansion, does sort of invent a third weight class for very specific units called Very Heavy where your movement rate is always two, no matter what, whether you have leaders or not. So when he gets down into this woods and then he has to crawl up a slope and then he's, you know, that costs you points and then the trees cost you points, it basically takes him a long time to get this far. Again, he's dragging a 106 pound machine gun disassembled through woods, up cliffs, and yeah, he's going pretty slow. Um, meanwhile, I tried to get some forces up here to start throwing RPGs into this mortar team because I was tired of that mortar team. And he starts to flank me with this uh, squad over there. Some civilians are continuing to move, so that's good. To get. Yeah, so civilians are more or less out of the way now. Most of the fighting clearly is going to be taking place here, and the civilians happily are, you know, clear of most of the lines of fire. So... Um, my BTR gets a little bit of vengeance on turn five, kind of comes down here, overruns Mr. Uh, Bakhtari and his fools. Um, Valorant Victory does have some pretty cool uh, overrun rules. He did get opportunity to fire with that douche. It didn't work, barely. Again, e hitting is easy. It's penetrating the armor that's tough. The BTR was then, over to, uh, was then able to overrun his ass. That includes... You know, the 60 caliber machine gun, the 50, the 30 caliber machine gun killed everybody in his stack except for him. He was uh, pinned down in this hex. On his turn five, he rallies and then moves one hex. I take opportunity to fire him because of his trees. He gets pinned down again. And then later on his turn, the command phase, he rallies again. So he escapes for now. I stress for now. He was trying to set up an assault where he was basically going to get a couple of these grenades and, uh, you know, maybe do some sort of a close assault on a vehicle. You can do that in Valorant Victory. Um, it's tough to do was you're a single man because, yeah, the enemy gets opportunity fire and your odds of surviving that all by yourself are not great. But if he still had the rest of his fire team or his squad or his two squads with him, yeah, you can totally bum rush a BTR, start throwing grenades and stuff like that into uh, wheels and suspension and engine decks and turrets and vision ports. The problem is he's there by himself now. And yeah, even Tom Hanks can't take out a tank by himself. He has other paratroopers, he has other rangers and paratroopers to help him. So that's his situation, at least for the moment. Um, I did get uh, a half squad up there and managed to evacuate some prisoners. Not prisoners, casualties. This battle's ongoing. My RPG keeps missing. Quick, interesting point. Or, interesting if you're into Valorant Victory. I don't know why this keeps not... Ah, it doesn't matter. Okay, so... 
Normally in Valorant Victory, the range of a Soviet-equipped force is a 6. That's based on the 30 caliber ammunition of a 7.62mm AKM family rifle. Usually the AK-47, but again, there's usually a hundred different versions of it. In Afghanistan, the vast majority of the motor rifles, Spetsnaz, other you know, forces actually involved there, were carrying the AK-74, which is a 5.45mm rifle with hollow point back weighted ammunition. So while very deadly, for sure, its range drops down to something similar to the American 556 NATO ball, 223 Remington, whatever you want to call it. Long story short, the range is only five. It's the middle number there instead of six when I designed the counters last night. So that's fine. The RPG can still hit because the range is exactly six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So long story short, the RPG can hit, but normally a half squad with a light support weapon can fire both his own or their own weapons and the light support weapon. That wasn't the case here just because of range. Interestingly, the uh, Afghans over here were in the same position. They had a PK, which is a, again, almost like an M240 or an M60, probably more like an M240. Um, 7.62 millimeter, belt fed, nice long barrel, gas operated. Um, that thing has a range of seven, so he's easily in range, but all those 5.45 millimeter AK-74s that are taken off of Soviet bodies in previous slaughters, not this slaughter, this slaughter's bad enough, but in previous slaughters, yeah. Now, honestly, I forgot to update the counters for Mujahideen leaders. So he still has a six. That's kind of a typo. We gave him the range of six in the game because it's printed on the counter. If it's a mistake, it's my fault. So even though he's pictured there, you can tell by the muzzle break, he's clearly carrying an AK-74. He has the range factor of an AK-47. That's on me. So we just said, look, he has one AK-47 and everybody in this little team is still carrying um, AK-74s. So he wound up with a total of five points, two, because he's in range, and three, he's definitely in range. These uh, 12 Mujahideen guys with AK-74s, not in range. And of course, the mortar is in range with a range of 12. However, the, uh, the actual crew is not. It doesn't matter in this case because that's a heavy support weapon, and a half squad cannot operate a uh, heavy support weapon and their own weapon in the same turn anyway. They have to sling arms to, you know, start humping around with uh, mortar shells. So, no worries there. So this long-range firefight started. It didn't really produce very much, um, at least at first. He, uh, what it did was it kind of, you know, either pinned him down, like you see here, Golikov keeps getting pinned down. It kept causing these Russians trouble, which allowed this team to flank around behind me I thought he was going to assault me. He started off here. He went through the little, uh, here's where they grow their opium. Went through their little poppy fields, then kind of headed up here. He went behind this tree line, not through it. So I actually never saw them and would eventually wind up in this objective hex to steal that objective hex away from me uh, as if I needed any more things to lose victory points over. But no worries. Um, so Vorpro Bite says, um, sadly, I cannot run my Vietnam game at Little Wars convention. Uh, I am not vaccinated. Oh, man. That's right. Uh, Little Wars is coming up here pretty soon. Oh, uh, would that be 60, 81, 82, or 120 millimeter mortars? That's a great, uh, great question. So the way Valorant Victory does it is any mortars that are ever on the table are light mortars. Those are going to be British two inchers. German 5 centimeters, American 60 millimeters, Soviet 50 or 60 millimeters, depending on the era. So that's your light company level mortars. The kind of mortars really nobody ever uses anymore because there's this thing in the world called grenade launchers. And grenade launchers are. You would have seen grenade launchers do awesome work in this game if Moron Ariskany hadn't blown away, you know, hadn't lost his grenade launchers like almost right off the bat. But. Whatever. I mean, look at that. Look at that attack factor. Look at that range. I would have been absolutely slain, Mujahideen. But hey, well, I, I can't complain. So long story short, anything that's on the table is going to be a 50, a 60, something like that, two inch, you 
know, pick your poison. It's a light company level mortar. The battalion level mortars, i.e. 81 or 82s, are going to be on the light barrage table. In fact, you can even see a little, you know, uh, mortar silhouette there. That's always off the table. So those things have a range usually of at least three kilometers. And uh, these are only like 20 meter, 15 meter axles. So three kilometers is way off the table. And then heavy barrages are 75 millimeter howitzers, 105 millimeter howitzers possibly, or your, like you were mentioning, 120 millimeter mortars. That's how Valorant Victory handles those kinds of weapons. On my game table today, says Forpo Bite, uh, the Marines walked into a village with the intention to search it. Instead, Geraldo did an investigative report on... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Never let the Marines within three hexes of a brothel. That literally never works. Never works. Never works. Trust me. I can tell you... You know, I'm, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to dox myself. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Probably the less said, the better there. It was a long time ago, and it was way before I met Jennifer, so it's all good. Okay, so where was I here? Yeah, that was pretty much the end of turn five. Turn six, I lost Golikov's whole squad, Golikov, or half squad. Golikov was uh, pinned down, and yeah, he took that other victory hex. I did manage to finally overrun the, uh, the Mujahideen leader, so he's now been spaghettified under my wheels. I still lost the game, obviously, but at least it was fun killing his commander. And, yeah, this game was pretty much... And it's totally my fault. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not saying the game wasn't fair. Even if the game wasn't fair, I designed it, it would still be my fault. So it doesn't matter. Um, but I, I totally screwed the pooch on this one. The score was an absolute nightmare. Uh, or a victory, a tremendous victory for our glorious Mujahideen freedom fighters, <laughs> if you believe that. So I suffered a total of eight casualty counters. That's either eight half squads, a full squad counts as two casualty figures. So basically uh, eight either fire teams, medic teams, or officers. So a grand total of eight casualty points. I managed to get six of them off the table, so I only pay the normal two points for those. Two of them bled out before I could get to them, so they count double. So they're four points apiece. Two times four is eight. Did lose two BTRs. They count as four points apiece. One for the crew, because the crew's, three-man crew is considered, you know, destroyed. And um, the vehicle itself. So that's why they count as double. And they shut down that crocodile, which is triple. So two times three is six. And then he held three of the objectives, because he stole one of my objectives at the last turn of the game. So I wind up with a horrific score of 20 plus 14 is 24. Sorry, 20 plus 14 is 34, plus 12 is 46. And I only, uh, again, I all my points are halved because I'm supposed to be better than the Mujahideen. I have tanks or at least APCs, off-board helicopter support. I mean, better, better troops. Nope. Not when, uh, not when a risk any plays them. So that's six casualties down. I lost, uh, you know, six points for. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I killed six casualty points worth of uh, his forces. Actually, I wound up killing nine, but three of them were POWs, so I get double points for that. A little bit of good news. So those three point, those three casualty counters were worth six. These six casualty counters are only worth six. It's really one apiece. And then I still have two objective points. Again, as we see over here, an objective is worth four points apiece. You add all that up, I come up with 20 points. 20 to 46. That's an ass whooping there, folks. That is an Alabama level behind the woodshed's ass whooping. Which, yeah, to top off a generally bad day with all kinds of technology and connectivity issues and everything else, on top of that, I got to get absolutely tuned up like a 1986 Honda Civic, man. I got tuned up bad in this game. I have no excuse. I just got the hell beat out of me. Um, which is fine. I've been on a bit of a winning streak lately. Uh, I've been winning a lot of uh, the games that have gone up uh, on our published channels. I've won a bunch of games at Dark Star recently. I've won games that are recorded that haven't even been put out yet you'll i probably just spoiled those videos sorry about that but um yeah i guess i was a little overdue for a bit of a 
uh, for a bit of humility. And sure enough, Damon accommodated. <laughs> That's for sure. So guys, that was the game that was supposed to go out live today at 2 p.m. Um, I'm happy I'm able to stream and at least do something uh, to get some kind of content out for you uh, here on Sunday night. Uh, I'm not sure. I may wind up just streaming on YouTube anyway, to be perfectly honest. Um, we never really get that many viewers on Twitch or Facebook. And honestly, I think when people click on our videos on Facebook, we're almost like stealing views from ourselves by having them watch them on Facebook, as opposed to clicking a link on Facebook that leads to our YouTube channel. So, I don't know, I'll talk it over with Bill. I may just go ahead and keep streaming on on YouTube only. That's where the vast majority of, at least, I don't know about the whole team. I'm not talking about our podcast shows, I'm not talking about our other recorded content, but at least for the stuff that I stream, my, my viewers are always on Facebook. I mean, I'm sorry, are always on YouTube, at least lately. An old mood saying, kill all they send and they will stop coming. Yeah, that eventually works. That eventually works, Warple Bite. Uh, history is on your side on that one. Alexander the Great would agree with that. Genghis Khan would agree with that. At least a couple Persian shop traps, sat traps would agree with that. The British would agree with you on that twice in the 1800s. The Soviets would agree with you on that. And of course now, sadly, the Americans would kind of agree with you on that. <sighs> I'm not upset that we pulled out of there. It was definitely the right move. I'm sad with how it was done. And honestly, I'm sad we didn't pull out of there 10 years earlier. We should have pulled out of there. When did we get Bin Laden? May of 2011. We should have been out of there by the end of 2011. By 2012, we should have been out of there. Um, and when we did finally make up our mind to get out of there, it, it should have been handled better. That was just, it, it wasn't, it was still, overall, it was the, definitely the right decision. There's no, there's no reason for us to be there. We're never going to fix the place. It's been broken for 3,000 years. But I don't want to get all political. Um, but, yeah. Um, I don't have a Facebook Vorpal Byte, uh Facebook account. Actually, you know what, Vorpal Byte? Neither did I until about, about a month ago. Uh, I have always sort of forsworn Facebook and social media in general. However, SitRep Podcast does have a great Facebook community. Uh, it's one of our major platforms, and in order to kind of be part of the team, I have to sort of pitch in and support our SITREP operations on all our channels, not just YouTube, Discord, and so on. So I got a Facebook account, and now I'm active on Facebook in a limited basis. I pretty much just help out with uh, SITREP Podcast um, on Facebook as well. So normally our streams go out on three channels, Twitch, Facebook, and especially YouTube. Just today, something was going wrong with our restream. Or something's wrong with my OBS account. I fixed it several times. It was up. We were up and running twice. For 45 seconds, and then again for like 19 minutes. And then it just crashed. And now it won't even let me start a new stream. Through our restream account. So I figured out a way to stream only on Facebook. And that's what you're, that's what you're seeing now. Uh, it was a lot easier. It was a lot simpler. It was a lot less prone to breakdown. I may just do this from now on. I don't know. I'll talk it over with Bill. It's up to Bill. Bill is obviously, I mean, we call him Sit Rep 6 for a reason. He's actually in charge. Sit Rep is totally his show. But I would, I would, I think I would rather just uh, stream on YouTube and then put the link on Facebook so that our, our Facebook community, which never comes out to our live streams anyway, but sometimes they do watch the, the, the recordings, they're directed to our YouTube channel and maybe then they'll subscribe or at least they'll kick up our view count. And maybe we'll get noticed by the algorithm a little bit more. I don't know. I don't want to talk about it, a political hot potato. Yeah, it's probably a, a dumb thing to bring up. Um, again, we're just we're just here to talk about war games. But anyway, guys, thanks everybody for um, coming out. Again, apologies for the uh, issues that we had earlier today. I see a lot of people in our chat. Not everyone, or in our view count, not everyone's chatting. Though. No worries at all, guys. Um, Warpal Bike says, I want to run my Vietnam game at Little Wars. Uh, I'm going to buy a forged vaccine document. <laughs> okay, dude. Well, now that's on the internet, so everyone can see it. <laughs> I promise I won't tell anybody. No, no worries. Okay, guys, we're taking off. Um, thanks very much. And again, apologies for our technical issues earlier today. 
We do now have this out for you, though, so definitely appreciate that. Um, we do have more pre-recorded content in the can, ready to go out for you at least on Wednesday. And, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, do remember, everyone, to please check out our podcast that went out yesterday. That includes our recent release, not our release, but the Slytherin and Matrix games and Yobo War games release of the Stalingrad DLC for this same uh, game system, Valor and Victory. Um, that's especially important for us here on the SitRep podcast because, honestly, I designed the scenarios that went out for that game. So the SitRep podcast is now officially in the video game business, uh, I'm happy to say. Sort of. I did the historical research. I did the actual scenario design. I drew the maps. I drew up the orders of battle. I play tested all the games. We went through all of the seven month nightmare, 1.4 million troops at a tight, um, sort of, you know, like gigantic campaign that was Stalingrad. I picked out 12 sort of seminal moments that, uh, based on my knowledge about the Battle of Stalingrad, we designed, or I designed Valorant Victory scenarios based on those. Custom maps, custom units. It's got snipers in there. You can't have uh, Stalingrad without snipers. We've got flamethrowers, we've got tanks, we've got Pavlov's house, Drzezinski Tractor Factory, the Grain Elevator, Ludnikov's Island. I mean, all the all the stuff you've read about in Valorant Victory, it's all in there. Or, I'm sorry, all the stuff you've read about in Stalingrad, it's all in there. Do you head over to uh, Slytherin, uh, check it out. You can download the game either uh, to your PC or via Steam. Um, and honestly, there's a tiny little sliver of royalty that comes to yours truly. Because, again, that's that's our design. Now, I submitted all this to my huge, great friend Lance. And then Lance and uh, the people he works with dealt with all the coding and actually putting it in the machine. But the scenarios, the history, the units, the objectives, the special rules, all that stuff, honestly, yeah. Um, so... Definitely thrilled to, to see that out. I see a ton of YouTube videos out there already. There's even a tournament there someone's got a planned. So I'm very happy to see it hit the ground running. Uh, don't miss the boat on that. And what else do we got here? Um, oh, yeah, we also talked about our new predictions for Ukraine. People who watch us, like our long-term fans, have seen us talk about Ukraine, or seen me, heard me talk about Ukraine, through previous months and years, and I've always had a very, very sort of uh, uh, don't worry about it, you know, relax. The, the, the news is trying to wind you up, chill out. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. And there were several key data points that I kept quoting. And one video, uh, April of last year, had like 21 sources that's in the description and also shown in the video itself 20 or uh, i think it was 21 22 sources all this information is drawn from guys nothing's gonna happen nothing's gonna happen this isn't just wishful thinking obviously things are changing over there now so we talked about it in yesterday's podcast get the full story back there um i did want to go on record with sort of you know time stamped videos saying uh i still hope i definitely hope nothing's gonna happen I still don't really think anything is going to happen, depending on your definition of anything. Um, there's already been intense, uh, intensified rocket and artillery strikes in the LNR and DPR over there in the eastern part of Ukraine. Who's doing it is, of course, you know, Kiev has its story. Who's doing it, whether or not it's a Russian false flag operation with the separatists are up to... Uh, there's there's a whole lot that uh, no one can really be sure. If anyone who thinks they're sure, trust me, they're not. So I'm not saying nothing's going to happen anymore. And again, in the podcast, I'm not going to repeat everything I said on the podcast. In the podcast, I'm not saying, oh, I'm changing my mind now because CNN says so. I'm changing my mind now because Fox News says so. Definitely don't listen to Fox News. I'm changing my mind now because the BBC doesn't say so. No, there's actual changes. I'm watching the number of battalion support groups. I'm watching the amount the amount of uh, not only how many soldiers are deploying, the rate at which they're deploying. Um, I'm looking at where they're deploying. I'm, look, I'm especially worried about the maneuvers in Belarus. It has me a little scared. 
I'm worried about the Chernobyl corridor down the Don. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, down, yeah, down the Don River. No, the um, the Dnieper River. Sorry. Uh, I'm worried about seeing Russian air defense missiles being deployed. I'm seeing pictures of S-300s and S-400s. That's scary. Not the missiles. The missiles are actually not as scary as the Russians would have you believe. But the fact that they're starting to move defensive weaponry in place. Before, they were all their air assault brigades, their guards, you know, air attack regiments, their tanks, all their motor rifle stuff, all their big, scary, big guns, bristly, spooky, scary stuff. Okay, you're rattling sabers and you're trying to get somebody on the phone. You're trying to coax a deal out of NATO. I get it. I get it. But now they're moving things into position that aren't necessarily scary, like air defense weapons. That's got me worried. Then I read bridging units are being moved into position. Nobody is scared of a bridge. You are not going to, you know, frighten the UN or frighten NATO into offering you strategic concessions because you put a bridge up or you have a mobile bridge ready to go. This is what you move into position when your army might actually want to go somewhere, especially into enemy or hostile or contested territory. And again, the fact that things are being redeployed, stuff going on in Belarus, um, even along the rest of the border, uh, the Ukrainian border, we are seeing greater concentrations of forces around LNR and DPR. That, that's starting to make me nervous. So I just wanted to go on the record again Went through all this in yesterday's podcast. Just want to put another quick, put up another quick note on today. There are specific data points that are causing me to uh, actually get a little nervous about what's going on in Ukraine. Still, definitely hope nothing happens. Maybe between 50 and 60 percent sure nothing huge is going to happen. There's going to be cyber attacks. In fact, there may have already been. There's going to be huge expanded support of separatists in um, Luhansk and Donetsk. There may even be more little green men. But as far as a full Zhukov-style invasion, even of a limited scope into the LNR and the DPR, I I'm still hoping, maybe, I'm, maybe I am just wishful thinking, I still don't think it's going to happen, but I am way less certain than I was even two months ago. Christmas, I was like, guys, nothing's going to happen. Because this whole thing kicked off in, like, what, the middle of November? And for the first six weeks... They've deployed 100,000 troops to Ukraine's border, and that number stayed the same. Okay, that's not how you set up an invasion. You don't deploy your whole force that you can deploy there at once and then just let it sit there without either shuffling it around or reinforcing it. Now they've been reinforcing it. I've seen numbers as high as 195,000. And again, not just the numbers, but the specific support units that are being moved in place and where they are. I'm looking at it with a little bit more detail. I don't have any kind of classified clearance. I don't have any information about what's really going on over there. But I am looking at it a little bit more deeply than you're going to read on the Huffington Post or the New York Times or Fox News or anything like that. So, again, just wanted to go on the record with that. Walk about games has joined us. Hello, God, uh, uh, God bless everybody, says Warpole Bite. Hello, uh, Walk about games. We're just about ready to close down. Um, walk about games. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. It's the air defense and engineering stuff that is scary. It shows that they want to take around. Yeah. Uh, before when the Russians were putting out their, again, their air assault brigades, their armored units, their guards tank brigades, you're just trying to scare somebody. You're, you're trying to, this is saber rattling. When you start moving bridges around, that's, that's worrisome. You're not, you, you, you might actually mean business now. So yeah, uh, we've gone through this a couple times now. Again, it's in yesterday's podcast are all the details. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick footnote of it today before I close out today's stream. Again, because um, I've been very glib, admittedly, about this in the past. And I stand by what I said in the past, because the data was different back then. Now, those data points have changed. And it's time to reassess and make a new determination, a new prediction. I don't really know what to predict now. I'm not going to lie. Um, I was confident in my predictions before, and lo and behold, I was right again, several times. This time, I don't think I could be right, at least not with any degree of confidence. So, yeah, this is when I'm going to get a little bit more, um, you know, reserved about what I say vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, NATO, the Russians, Belarus, and all that. So, we'll see. Uh, we're still hoping for the best. Uh, Jundi, if I'm saying that right, welcome to the stream. 
Thanks very much for coming out. I don't think I've seen you here before. Welcome to Sit Rep Podcast. We're actually just kind of done. Um, this stream was supposed. To, this game was supposed to go live earlier today at two o'clock. Uh, we had some pretty serious technical issues that kind of threw a, two, a few uh, monkey wrenches in our plans. So my friend Damon and I played the game, recording little bits as we went. Um, and then after that, I said, you know what? Why don't I just, you know, stream just on YouTube? Because of exactly where the problem was. Our problem was with our restream and our multi-channel streaming. But to just try and stream on one account on YouTube, that seems to be working fine. So, yeah, we went over all this stuff. Uh, I'm not going to do it again, obviously. So, again, I'm sorry that uh, some of you guys are just showing up. But, uh, yeah, I think we're just about done for the day. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming out. All right, everybody, this is Arisk and Gym. I'm closing out the stream again. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Enjoy your holiday tomorrow. Uh, I know a lot of us have a holiday. I know Canada has a holiday tomorrow. America has a holiday tomorrow. I'm pretty sure Great Britain has a holiday tomorrow. Uh, it's a, it's President's Day here in the U.S. I think Canada, it's Family Day. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what it is in the U.K. Maybe nothing. But for now, this is Ariskany signing off. Thanks very much, everybody, and apologies again for the nightmare of technical issues we had earlier. This replay link will go on our other platforms so nobody's left out. But for now, signing off. Enjoy your Sunday, enjoy your evening, enjoy your holiday if you have tomorrow off, and we'll be in touch very soon. Take care, everybody.